Question 6. Two types of seismic waves are P waves and S waves. Seismic waves are an elastic wave in the earth produced by earthquake. Question A. State the type of wave that P waves and S waves can be modeled as. This is what P waves and S waves look like. As you can see here, P waves move in parallel so they can be modeled as longitudinal wave whereas S waves move like transverse wave. Question B. The velocity of a P wave in the Earth's solid crust is 7.2 km per second and its frequency is 4.5 Hz. Calculate the wavelength of this P wave. The speed of a wave can be calculated by frequency multiplied by wavelength. When stating equations, make sure you use the right letters. For example, when representing wavelength, make sure you use lambda and not L or W. If you can't remember the correct letters, then just state the word equations. Another reminder is that you should be careful with your units. Wavelength are usually measured in meters, frequency in hertz, and speed would be in meters per second. Since the speed here is given in kilometers per second, we have to convert this to meters per second. 1 kilometer equals to 1000 meters, so this would give us a value of speed in meters per second which is 7200 meters per second. Okay, now we can calculate the wavelength here which is speed divided by its frequency. Let's substitute all the values given. You will be getting a value of wavelength which is 1,600 meters. Question 7. Figure 7.1 shows a container of oil. A ray of light shines on the surface of the oil. The refractive index of the oil is 1.47. Question A. On figure 7.1, draw the normal at the point where the ray enters the oil. Since this is your boundary, you should draw a normal perpendicular to your boundary at a 90 degree angle. So this is what your normal should look like. Question B. The angle X is 56 degrees. Question wants you to calculate the angle of refraction. When you are required to calculate a value, you should know the formula relevant to the information given in the question. As such, refractive index is given and the angle over here is given. But pay attention, this question is a little bit tricky. Even though the angle given here is 56 degree, this is not the angle of incidence. Because angle of incidence is supposed to be here, and when your light refracts, your angle of refraction will be here. Remember, angle of incidence and angle of refraction is adjacent to its normal. Okay, now let's move on to the calculation part. The formula related to refractive index, angle of refraction, and angle of incidence is N equals to sine I over sine R. Okay, now we can substitute the values that we have into the formula. The value of N is 1.47. Sine I, I is the angle of incidence, which is over here. This is a total of 90 degree angle minus 56 degree you will get an angle of incidence which is 34 degree. Over sine r. Let's rearrange this. Now, to find the value of r, you should bring your sine to the other side. You will get the value of r, 22.36 degree. Changing this into two significant figures, you would get 22 degree. Next, question C. State the approximate speed of light in air. This is a value that you have to memorize. The speed of light in air is 3 times 10 to the power of 8. Do not forget your unit meters per second. Another value related that you should know is the speed of sound in air, which is approximately 330 to 350 meters per second. Question D. Calculate the speed of light in the oil. Give your answer to three significant figures. When a ray of light moves from one medium to another medium, the speed of the light would change. So, to calculate the speed of light in oil, we can use this formula. 
refractive index equal to the speed of light in vacuum divided by the speed of light in oil. The refractive index is already given here which is 1.47 and we know that the speed of light in air is 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. So to find the speed of light in oil, we can just rearrange this equation and get a value of 2.04 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. Please do not forget to write your units. Question 8a. Part 1. State what is meant by a magnetic field. A magnetic field can be defined as the region around the magnet where a force acts on another magnet. Part 2. Define the direction of a magnetic field. The direction of a magnetic field is the direction of the force of the north pole of a magnet at that point. Question B. Figure 8.1 shows a negatively charged metal sphere. On figure 8.1, draw four lines to show the electric field and its direction. The direction of electric field is always towards negative charges and away from positive charges. Question C, figure 8.2 shows a circuit. The three cells are identical and have zero resistance. The resistance R1, R2, and R3 are identical. The reading on the voltmeter is 6 voltage. When the diode is conducting, it has zero resistance and zero potential difference across it. Here is your diode. Part 1. Determine the electromotive force of one cell. The electromotive force is your potential difference here, and for all three cells it's mentioned is 6 voltage. That means the electromotive of one cell is 6 voltage divided by 3 cells, giving us 2 voltage for each cell. Part 2. Determine the ratio on the potential difference across R2 to the potential difference across R3. Okay, so we need to find the voltage of resistance 1, 2, and 3 in order to solve this question. We know that the voltage being supplied is 6 voltage. So there will be 6 voltage being supplied all the way here. Until it reaches the parallel circuit, it will split into 3 voltage each. It will be equally spread because all the resistors are identical. So 3 voltage here and 3 voltage here. And the total voltage going back to R3 would be 6 voltage. And 6 voltage continues back to complete the circuit. So we know that R3 has 6 voltage and R2 has 3 voltage. So R2 to R3 is 3 voltage to 6 voltage, which in ratio can be written as 1 to 2. Next, part 3. All the cells are reversed. Question 1. State and explain the change in current in R1. Okay, let's look at the circuit. If the batteries are reversed, this is what it would look like. And your current would now flow in the opposite direction, meaning that it will flow like this. Going through your diode in this direction. The diode is now on the opposite side of the current flow, meaning that there will be no current passing through R1. This means that the current in R1 is zero. So if I mention current is zero, I'm only stating the change in the current. Even though the question gives you one mark, you still have to explain the change in current. The explanation is because diode is now in wrong direction. And question two, determine the new value of the ratio of the potential difference across R2 to the potential difference across R3. Okay, going back to our circuit, now that the cells are reversed, there will be no current flowing through R1, meaning that no voltage will pass through R1. The new part for volt would only go through R3 and R2 and then back to complete the circuit. R3 and R2 are now placed in a series circuit. We know that the voltage across the series circuit remains same. So 6 voltage here and also 6 voltage here. 
So the new value for the ratio for potential difference across R2 to R3 is 6 voltage to 6 voltage, which can be simplified to 1 to 1. Question 9a. Table 9.1 shows some properties and values for alpha particle, beta particles, and gamma radiation. Complete Table 9.1. Let's look at alpha radiation first. An alpha particle is the same as helium nucleus, so it has 2 proton number and 4 nucleon number. The proton number is already filled out for us here. Number of neutrons is nucleon number minus proton number, which will give us 2 neutrons. For beta, they are fast-moving electrons, so they do not have any protons. They also do not have any neutrons, and the charge is negative 1. And lastly, for beta, they do not have any protons, neutrons, neither any charge. But gamma ray have a very high energy, so they can only be stopped by thick concrete or thick lead. Question B. State how beta decay changes the nucleus of an atom. A beta decay changes the nucleus of an atom in a way that it will have one less neutron and one more proton. So the atom now becomes more stable. Question C. A radiation detector used in a laboratory detects a background radiation rate of 30 counts per minute. A radioactive source is placed in front of the radiation detector. The initial reading on the detector is 550 counts per minute. The half-life of the source is 25 minutes. Calculate the expected reading on the detector after 75 minutes. Your first step should be to identify and remove background radiation to find the initial count rate due to the source alone. So the detector gives you 500 counts per minute and we know that background radiation which exists at all time is 30 counts per minute. This leaves us with 520 counts per minute, meaning that this is the initial count rate from the source alone without any background radiation. Okay, and your step 2 should be to calculate how many half-lives has passed. It mentions here that half-life is 25 minutes and they're looking for the reading after 75 minutes. So 75 minutes divided by 25 minutes tells us that 3 half-lives has passed. The next step would be to set up a number line to calculate the activity after 3 half-lives. So initially, it was 520 counts per minute. After 1 half-life, it becomes 260. So this is 1 half-life. After going through 3 half-lives, you will be left with a count rate of 65 counts per minute and this is the count rate for the source alone. But the detector will not only show you the radiation from the source, it will also include the background radiation. So the reading on the detector that you will see is 65 counts per minute from the source alone together with 30 counts per minute which is the background radiation. The reading on your detector is 95 counts per minute. Next, question D. State two safety precautions taken when moving, using, or storing radioactive sources in a laboratory. Question 10, Part A. State the equation that defines the average orbital speed v of a planet. State the meaning of any symbols you use. The average orbital speed of an object can be defined by the equation v equals to 2 pi r over t. They want you to state the meaning of any symbols used. v has already been stated here for you which is the orbital speed. So what's left for you to define is r and t. R is the average radius of the orbit in meters and T is the orbital period in seconds. Question B. Suggest why countries that are significant distance from the equator experiences significant temperature variation throughout the year. 
This happens due to the tilt of the Earth's axis resulting in the sun striking the countries at a different angle throughout the year. Question C. Fill in the gaps in the paragraph about a star much more massive than the sun. The stage that follows the stable state in the life cycle of the star is the blank stage. Okay, let's look at the overview of the life cycle of a star. This is the stable stage. And for a star that is more massive than a sun, it becomes a red supergiant. So the answer is the red supergiant stage. It then explodes as a supernova to form a blank. And this leaves behind two things. When it explodes as supernova, it forms a nebula and leaves behind either a neutron star or a black hole. Question D. A galaxy is moving away from Earth with a speed of 33,000 km per second. The value of Hubble constant is 2.2 times 10 to the power of 18 per second. Calculate the distance from the galaxy to the Earth. Give your answer in light years. Let's list down all the known quantities given in this question. The Hubble law formula can be written as 1 over h0 equals to distance over velocity. We are looking for the distance here, so rearrange it and we will get distance equals to velocity divided by Hubble constant. The velocity is 33,000 km per second. And Hubble constant is 2.2 times 10 to the power of negative 18 per seconds. You must remember this formula and the value of Hubble constant. This will now give us a value of distance at 1.5 times 10 to the power of 22 unit is kilometers. Okay, we have got our distance in kilometers and now we have to convert it to light years. 1.5 times 10 to the power of 22 kilometers converted to meters would be 1.5 times 10 to the power of 25 meters. If 1 light year equals to 9.5 times 10 to the power of 15 meters, then how many light years would 1.5 times 10 to the power of 25 meters be? Using your knowledge of maths, you should be able to obtain 1.5 times 10 to the power of 9 light years. I'm just going to simplify this to two significant figure which is 1.6 and the final answer would be 1.6 times 10 to the power of 9 light years. Thank you for watching this video. I hope it was worth your time and if you have any questions, please ask me in the comment section below.